screen. Um, all right, so let me know. <laughs> One second here. Ah, come on. There we go. All right, so hopefully everybody can see see what's going on there. Um, just need to move a couple of windows around real quick. Give me give me a quick second here. I realized that I was going to cover up everything that I was doing here. Okay, cool. Thank you, Kenneth. Appreciate that. All right, so let me go ahead and jump in here. So this is this is my annual address. So this is the uh, we used to call it the, the official, right? But Amazon gets butt hurt anytime you use any kind of branding that they that belongs to them, right? So <laughs> I'm going to call it the unofficial uh, Amazon State of the Union address. This is, of course, for February 2023. Let me go ahead and jump right in here. So assuming that my my slide did in fact change to the the second slide here, what we're talking about today is uh, just in part. The latest economic trends uh, for the future of Amazon, the latest tech to transform how you do business on in the Amazon space, which I'm a geek about for sure. And of course, what I see is Amazon's next next moves uh, and how they could result in huge gains for your brand. There's also some risk involved. I'll go ahead and cover that later on. And then, of course, as I promised at the end, I'll go ahead and give you the replay link for the artificial intelligence webinar that I did last time. Uh, I'll put that at the end of the presentation just so you can get a quick QR screenshot of that and uh, go and watch that because you've got to see that. No question. So quick, uh, uh, quick prompt, or I guess quick... Uh, I used to use prompt, right, for, for AI. So quick uh, shout out to, of course, my team over at Canopy Management. We have done, we've got a phenomenal track record over at Canopy Management. They're the ones who sponsor this show as it is. And so for those of you who are in a position where you have been growing your brand and you've got it established, but you need to level up, right? You've got to go to the experts that have been doing this a long time, and we've got a proprietary system that helps guarantee some of the great results that we get for our clients. So if you want a chance to work with our team, uh, certainly reach out to us. Uh, put the, um, of course, there's a QR code. Um, I'll, I'll put this in, uh, in toward the end as well, uh, along with the URL. Go ahead and reach out to us if you want to at least have a conversation to see, are you there yet? Maybe, maybe so, maybe not yet. Um, see what kind of feedback we can give you as far as like how to get to the level where we generally work with uh, partners and help them grow. And uh, one of the things that I learned uh, recently is that we've helped uh, over, what is it? we've helped 27 brands now exit to be acquired profitably because we were help, able to help them level up uh, their game and help them exit for uh, so that they could retire. So I love that. I love it when that happens. So hopefully you're the next one. Um, for those who are not familiar with me previously, my name is Brian Johnson. Um, I haven't, uh, I'm a little, let's say, I was gonna say I'm a little rough on the webinars because I, I took a huge break last year because I was focused on some pretty critical backend stuff uh, for for the agency and so now I am back in order to do uh, you know to kind of get you some of the updated information as far as what we're seeing internally so this will be good so for those of you who are not aware of me. I've been in e-commerce for about 15 years. I've been in the Amazon space for about eight years now. And in my time on the Amazon space, I've been privileged. I love helping brands grow, improve, get, you know, get an edge up on their niche, right? And what that has resulted through my agency, through my courses, through just my own consulting, through uh, just my own uh, interaction with the, uh, the brands that sell on Amazon, I have been very privileged to have helped over 25,000 brands grow their sales on Amazon in my career by over 2.2, it's actually closer to two and a half billion dollars. Now, I love that number. I, I 
you know, I'm not, I'm not going to make a sign and put it on the side of my car or anything like that. I just think it's cool because uh, it, I look back on, on my career and say, it's like, you know what, I, I actually did show up, right? I came out with, you know, the first software and the first training course, you know, for advertising uh, and certainly co-founded um, what is now an Inc. 500 um, advertising agency, Canopy Management. And uh, I, I've had a lot of opportunity and I love the Amazon space. I love the seller community. Um, they've done right by me. And so I try every single day to try to do, try to give them the best advice and try to live by my own actions when it comes to my own brands um, as well. And so uh, hopefully that combination works for each of you. So let me move forward. Um, all right, so let's talk about 2022. Let me go look back and say, okay, originally in previous years, right, I predicted as far as what do I expect in 2022 as far as what's going to happen. My top five of these, right? Um, rebalancing the cash flow. In other words, jobs. In other words, people have been blowing through their savings like crazy throughout the pandemic, and now it's kind of it's coming back around to them needing jobs. The problem with that. <laughs> of course, is uh, the actuality of that is, yes, in fact, they do need the jobs, but jobs are starting to, they're not drying up, but I, I would say they're not as readily available necessarily in the field that people were hoping to get back into. Maybe they took a couple years break. Uh, maybe they work from home. Maybe they started their own, uh, their own enterprise, maybe on, in the Amazon space. But Here's why that matters to you is they are the consumers. They're the ones who are buying their products. And frankly, when it comes to uh, the economy changing so that the uh, uh, you know, jobs are, are maybe less available, some people who had jobs are, are, are losing their jobs. Inflation has definitely taken a, a big hit as far as monthly income, overall cost of living, the, the way that people have changed their lifestyles because they, they've got kids that were traditionally in school five days a week. I know in my own area, we just proposed, or I shouldn't say we, should say the city proposed that they move to a four day a week schedule because most students don't show up on Friday because they've got some at home school kind of program that they're doing or other activities based around their parents' work. Now, what that means is that you do have a lot more people who are shopping from home, who have lower overhead. They don't have to commute necessarily, but now a lot of companies are pulling, uh, pulling a, a job, uh, you know, pulling employees back to the office, especially things in financial, you know, banking, investment, that type of thing. Uh, and a number of, certainly every manufacturing, they're pulling it back in, right? Well, they're not automating. But what that means is um, a lot of those who find that now they've gone through their savings. Now things have gotten more expensive that they are forced to go back to work. What does that mean to, uh, to the jobs that they take? Well, now they're finding out is that maybe they're not taking the jobs that they had previously enjoyed, which means they may not be getting the same wage that they previously enjoyed relative to the cost of living, right? And so what that does certainly does affect, as does any kind of um, retraction in the economy, it does affect the way that consumers spend money. They tend to focus more on commodity purchases and less so on luxury purchases, right? One off. Right. So if it depends on what product that you are in, in your niche is going to make a difference as far as whether or not you're going to see a bigger, uh, a bigger influx of traffic or a reduction in traffic. And what do you do about it? Right. I'm going to talk about some of those things. Um, let me jump forward here. Uh, certainly, they're going to be start selling off. If you are heavy on cash by, by chance, because you have that much foresight, then you already know is that when the economy sucks, is a great time to be buying when you have cash. Um, you know, people like Warren Buffett set aside like $100 billion so they can inquire, acquire entire companies uh, in order to, to take advantage of things being on sale, right? Um, and so uh, that's how the big boys play it. I'm not anywhere near that level. So, uh, but shoppers, I did say shoppers would continue to trust the influencers that show care for their, their best interests. Um, yes, uh, the, the, the influencers still, when it comes to, to style and everything, the problem is if the, it happens, happens to be an influencer that's pushing a premium brand, maybe a luxury brand, 
those who generally shop for luxury are going to continue to shop for luxury luxury because they've got multiple streams of income they are more stable when it comes to economic changes right uh but what that means for the average consumer is they'll probably pull away from again as i mentioned before pull away from some of the luxury items and go towards some of the commodity items now if you sell a product that is you might classify as uh either luxury or uh kind of a specialty item maybe something you know it's like well you know people don't need to have this it's more of a, i want it i don't need it that means you need to focus more heavily on differentiating your product from competitors and really having a competitive benefit statement in your product listings to make sure that shoppers understand what's in it for them if they get your product. In other words, you can't sit by and just say, you know what, I've been using the same product listing I have for the last five years. It should still work. It's not going to because for a number of reasons, and I'll cover those toward the end as well, is your competition is changing. So you've got to be changed. You've got to be adapting to not only the consumer, but also what your, your competition is doing. I'll get into more detail on that. Um, let's see here. Compliance. <laughs> yes, Amazon and their lovely compliance issues. Usually it's because some lawyer out there or some regulation agency is putting pressure on Amazon to change. Uh, and so what ends up happening is that Amazon, of course, comes down on us as sellers, right? How many of you uh, in the chat, how many of you put a one in there if you have uh, ever come across anything where you've been uh, had a compliance violation or you your listing was suppressed because of a word you used in your content or something like that. Uh, I know I have, I know I, I lost, I had a listing that was gone for um, two months because Amazon simply just mistook a relationship that my brand had with another brand that was a bad apple. Well, in that case, it just turned out that bad apple happened to use the same 3PL warehouse as I did. And because they made that loose connection, my listing was down for two straight months. Uh, a lot more problems resulted as a result of that two months being down, but I won't get into that. But at the same time, it definitely happened. So can, yeah, it's, okay. Uh, yeah, hopefully it wasn't too serious, uh, but it, it certainly happens on a regular basis. Certainly, if you're in anything that is consumable, and I'll talk about this more under compliance, um, anything consumable, anything topical, in other words, beauty, anything you put on your face and your skin, anything that you consume, you eat, supplements, uh, food, any of that kind of stuff, all of those are going to be under strict scrutiny in next this year and next year and moving forward when it comes to safety standards and safety testing. So if you have not, if you're in that kind of a product niche and you don't already have a, an Amazon approved safety lab testing for your product, get it done now because the habit of Amazon is to go in and shut down an entire product niche, except for theirs because they already have the safety testing. And uh, and then those who are allowed back on are those who go out and have the product safety testing done. So if you're in that category, if you're in that kind of a product, get started now to solve for that because it will happen. Uh, let's see here. All right, let's move forward here. Now, some of the things that, that certainly we've observed um, in last year as far as the economy. Um, certainly one of the things that we saw is the e-commerce sales accounted for about 15%, a little bit less than 15% of total retail sales, up 25% from previous year. Now, what that means is more shoppers essentially uh, shifted over from other e-commerce platforms um, or from brick and mortar, mostly brick and mortar, because I will say is that, uh, you know, things like uh, Shopify has up their game. Walmart.com is up their game. And so they are pulling away some of those consumers. Walmart.com is going to have a better advantage during a poor economy than Amazon will. And so some of those, uh, because they have a, a generally a lower price point and a different audience, they've got brick and mortar stores all across the country. They have an advantage during this time of course, uh, compared to Amazon. 
So something to consider. I know certainly we've got clients at Canopy that are both in Amazon and Walmart, and we, we advise them as far as like how to position properly. You don't need to do your entire catalog. You need to pick and choose which products fit into both locations and can, can succeed and add additional sales to balance things out um, as the economy you know, moves around and shifts, right? Uh, consumer spending, so, so personal income, income actually increased, uh, mostly because of minimum wage laws going into effect in, in multiple states, uh, but consumer spending uh, decreased uh, as of fourth quarter, just slightly. I expect that that will, because of the, the pressure from inflation, because of job layoffs in certain regions, uh, because of a number of things, I think that uh, because of exhausting savings accounts, uh, I think we'll see a lot more of that where there's going to be a little bit less uh, discretionary spending for the luxury items. Um, inflation, job security, reduction in savings. Yep, cover those. Um, the result on Amazon, generally less consumer traffic and spending. Uh, you, we've already seen that over the past year, year and a half, as far as where the traffic on Amazon has generally reduced. That means you need to up your game on your individual product listings, make sure that you've got an above average conversion rate and you're constantly testing using Amazon experiments to split test your main image and your title at a minimum every single month throughout the year to make sure that you're getting even a 0.1% advantage on your competition. If you're not doing Amazon experiments split testing, I will beat you every single day, every single year based on the fact that I will continue to improve while you're static, okay? So don't be the static, okay? Don't just stand there and just hope that things will change. Make a, a proactive effort in order to get, to get a competitive advantage. Uh, listing optimization, number one, right? I, you know, I, I co-founded an advertising agency and I'm saying advertising is not the first one. Listing optimization, no question. Conversion rate optimization making sure that you're grabbing that shopper, differentiating your product from your competitors, giving your shoppers a compelling reason to want your product, not simply just making them figure it out, not simply just telling them what the, the uh, key features are and the, you know, the, the you know, statistics are for the product. They don't care. They want to know what's in it for them. Okay. Um, I will say is that the inexperienced competitors that you have are going to, their gut reaction is going to spend more on advertising because that's the only lever that they know to pull. They don't know that their listings suck, right? They need to change. So uh, they'll also try to press down the, the price point. Don't get trapped by that. If you find you're getting, uh, if you're starting to lower your price in order to match your com com competitors, You've been hooked. You've been trapped uh, by their game, not controlling what you're doing. You should be uh, keeping your price the same, if not raising your price. That's certainly something that we do at Canopy. So because we make the necessary changes in order to be ahead of the niche, to dominate the niche, rather than get trapped by everybody else's panic. Okay, don't be, don't panic. Uh, some of the things that certainly have changed uh, as far as uh, last year. Um, for the for 2022 is the big one, of course, search query performance analytics, uh, both for search terms and for products for ASINs. Uh, I, if you have not looked at that, absolutely, you need to go in and you start looking at that. Uh, search query performance analytics you can find through your brand dashboard, through brand analytics, and then into search query performance. There's also some additional advertising reports that you want to take a look at that help under help you understand how your products are getting visibility uh, for individual search terms relative to your competitors. Is it accurate? Yeah, yeah I would say it's probably you know 80% accurate. Use it as a guideline. Uh, same kind of thing is with a lot of the, the, the things that you ask, you know, some of the new AI chat tools, uh, you're gonna get about an 80% correct answer. Use it as a guideline, not as a law, okay? Same thing with Amazon reporting, use it as a guideline, as a benchmark. Same thing with any tool that you use in the Amazon seller space, use it as a guideline, not as, oh, this is the, you know, this is the law, right? But without a, but without a doubt, we've seen some of the biggest gains by understanding 
where we're already strong as far as visibility and market share and visibility dominance uh, if for certain search terms so that we don't have to keep pressing so hard on advertising as an example we can redirect some of that ad budget over to other terms that we thought we were doing well on and maybe we had some room to grow we were actually positioned uh maybe on the second page let's bump that forward to first page right it's not going to solve your ranking issue it's going to improve your ranking issue especially if you target it to those search terms that have a bigger opportunity you know maybe that's on page two and you want to be on page one for higher visibility maybe it has fewer current competitors who are ranking well for that or trying to go after it those are things that you need to kind of look at some of your tools uh, in order to assess the opportunities but amazon has definitely given us a lot more visibility with search query performance analytics so definitely definitely take a look at that uh, amazon of course added more advertising bid recommendations they're big on recommendations and suggestions again uh advertising bid recommendations brand headline you know even content recommendations uh impression forecasting for certain uh, for certain search terms. The challenge on those is there's a lot more factors that go into the ad auction that, again, it's a guideline, it's a suggestion. It's not, oh, if I Amazon says that I will double my visibility, I'll go from 5,000 views to 10,000 views uh, if I just advertise in this one search term. Yeah, ish. It depends on your on your placement and and uh, you know match type and bidding strategy and all these kind of things, right, from an advertising standpoint. Um, Amazon marketing stream uh, is still in beta, but it is something they introduced that, that provides more real time, uh, quasi real time ad data, ad campaign metrics. This is uh, something that we at the at Canopy are looking at very closely because it has a lot more, um, a lot more potential uh, to grow and to provide us better analytics overall for uh, for each of our partners that we work with um, amazon also expanded their product targeting uh to to uh, you know to not only target existing asins you, in other words you may be targeting existing asins right competitor asins or related asins and they say well you know there's some uh, there's a whole bunch of other products that are related to it either other competitors that you haven't targeted yet or they are uh, related products right you know batteries for a camera that, that, that type of thing problem with that is you are then handing control back over to Amazon to make that choice for you. If you don't have a team or any kind of automation or, uh, and I haven't seen any automation that does at this level, um, it, you know, or simply just don't have the time to work on it, then maybe that's a good option to let Amazon just trust that Amazon will figure it out. But you still have to go back and make sure did Amazon actually execute on this correct? Anytime they want to have control over things, whether it's an automatic campaign or expanded targeting or any kind of like, hey, let us control the bid or the targeting, you've got to make sure that they're just like they're a consultant, you've got to make sure that they're doing their job. If not, fire them, <laughs> right? Um, let's see here. Which new ad type is guaranteed to grab the attention of the shopper? Open up that chat box. How many, how many have you got that one figured out? Which new ad type came out in 2022 that has the highest likelihood of grabbing the eyeballs, grabbing the attention of the shopper? Come on, need some more. Come on, let's go. If you're doing other stuff, then leave. Participate. Okay, got a few more, thank you. Yes, all right, there we go. Now we're getting it, okay, video, yes. Headline video ads, these are, so think of it, so sponsored brand headline ads that go up above organic search results, having a video right on top. I've said in past, uh, in the past is, uh, I did an extensive uh, user experience study with in e-commerce that um, that judge as far as like how, what, what attracts a shopper's eye first, right? Was it motion? Was it color? Was it things that stood out? Was it white space? Was it whatever the case is, the direction that things were pointing? All of those we tested. Video, motion, 
from video was the number one, right? Problem that Amazon always had is that video typically, the sponsored brand video, was typically just below the fold, right? It was just below visibility. So what that means is uh, it didn't catch the shopper's eye first. Usually the second thing, which was the, the bright, high contrast colors, red, blue, green kind of you know, color pop, only when the rest of the competition generally was not using that same color, okay? So it only stands out if it actually stands out, right? If it's actually different from what your, from what your competition is doing. So uh, the, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, headline video ads, uh, this is something now, the way that it's set up right now is it does direct back to your store. So you, it's not like you're, you're pointing to individual products, uh, but you, for your storefront, but we have certainly been testing it and it does a great job of grabbing the attention of the shopper, grabs their eye right away. They're much more likely to click through to it. Uh, and so we get a lot more traction when we run the headline video ads, uh, sponsored, uh, sponsored brand ad position uh, because it has the motion, right? So good job, good voting. Um, as far as e-commerce tech, e-commerce tech is the one that I love this topic. So in 2022, uh, we saw a lot more consolidation analytics engines. That sounds like a whole, that sounds like horseshit, right? No, it is actually, think of it. So if those of you familiar with things like Data Dive, Keyword Dominator, Cobalt, um, even, even things on a kind of a light case Cerebro, those that take multiple data sources and bring them together. Now, technically, things like Data Dive, Keyword Dominator, they pull in from tools like Jungle Scout and Cerebro and some seller tools and some of these. Um, and so they're consolidating additional information that's already pulled together by other software that's consolidated uh, different data sources, right? Uh, but we definitely see a lot more where the advancement of software tools that are available do a great job of helping you to assess your strengths and weaknesses in the, in the product niche, as far as where you're positioned for specific search terms, which search terms are actually going to uh, like have the highest likelihood of your product ranking for, as well as actually producing sales for. If you are running blind to that, yes, these do cost money, right? They're, they're, sometimes they're not cheap, but the, the top sellers are definitely using tools like this in order to figure out what are the sweet spots in a product niche where I can rank the highest without overspending. I can, I can, I only need to push so hard because I only know that there's a ceiling on one search term, but the sky's the limit on the other search term, right? And so you want to make sure that you have, um, have some additional, you know, visibility in that sense. You could get away in part by looking at things like uh, helium 10 cerebro if that's something you, you subscribe to um there is no ai or no automation tool out there that has enough information in order to do a job um so like some of the ai uh ad tools and everything yeah they're getting better they're probably about two years out before i would actually start trusting them because they're they're so inconsistent in their performance because they simply just don't have enough information they don't have enough uh, data inputs to to have a proper perspective. They're still primarily just looking at the data, the metrics that Amazon gives them. That's not enough. Okay, you've got to be looking at who your target audience is, what their pain points are, what solutions are they looking for, what how your product differentiates from your competitors' products. There's no tool out there right now that does that. That's where the human intuition comes into play. Right now, will AI get to the point where it can do that? I've actually shown just in my last webinar where it's starting to creep into that area. So yes, it will get there. Uh, we'll see a lot more where these tools are starting to integrate. Some of them, they're strictly just using it from the marketing. Most tools in the Amazon space that claim to have AI did it for marketing, not because they're actually using machine learning for any real reason. So um, I don't recommend any of the, uh, the PPC automation software to your question, Ken. Uh, simply because the inconsistency of it. I've seen from every single product that's out there, I've seen where it's done fantastic and I've seen where it's a train wreck. So they just don't have the consistency because they don't have the oversight. Um, now, let me kind of advance this forward, right? Because there is, you know, there's, there's light to the end of this, right? 
the tools will get better, right? Maybe they're not there now, right? Maybe they're more marketing hype than they are actual consistent results, but they will continue to improve over time. And there will be an opportunity where I even myself will use some of these automation tools. Uh, I certainly use automation, but in, as far as the advertising automation, no, not at this time. Uh, there are a couple that I am testing now. Can you do that? Um, 2022, of course, the end of November 2022, OpenAI rolled out ChatGPT, which was the conversational interface for a language model that they have with what they call GPT-3, which is their uh, machine learning environment um, model that they have at OpenAI. And of course, there's, you know, there's a dozen, dozen other artificial intelligence houses out there, including, uh, of course, you know, Google and Google just in the past, you know, month rolled out their Google Bard and both platforms, there'll, there'll be others that will come out this year, but both platforms have opened our eyes as far as the potential of what it can do. It can certainly take your product listings from a 40% garbage uh, you know, garbage written product listing to a 70, 80% maybe. Uh, if it does, it has a really good day, you really tell it exactly how to do things, uh, probably an 80% uh, quality level, not quite the 100% that we like to operate at, but 80% uh, not bad if the rest of your competition is at 40%, right? So you at least need to look into it, um, it, it you know, before, um, you know, before they do, <laughs> is what, I, what I'm suggesting, to increase your, uh, the benefit drive of your product listing and the differentiation of your product compared to others, right? All right, let me move forward here. Um, quick screenshot for those of you who joined us late. Um, this is sponsored by Canopy Management. If you do want to have a conversation with us to see whether or not you'd be a good fit to work with Canopy and for our advertising and marketing system, we've got a proprietary system that has some phenomenal and consistent uh, track record, then go ahead and reach out to us. Otherwise, I'll keep moving. I realized that my... Uh, I, I realized that the uh, the, the image uh, says Canopy Webinar on this <laughs> um, for, for my view. Uh, my name is Brian Johnson, if you didn't catch that, if you joined in late. So, and I know some of you did. So, all right. So let's talk about this year. All right. This is when it starts getting really cool. And then don't forget at the end of this, I'll go ahead and share a couple of links. One of those includes the replay for my last webinar, which talked about uh, just kind of a collection of some of my favorite uh, AI uh, tool tactics that I use within my own Amazon business in order to up my game and to, to get an advantage on my competitors. I'll give you the replay link for that at the end of this webinar, um, as well as like kind of discuss, you know, one of my, my favorite examples that I use on that. But 2023, all right. Give me a five in the chat if, if you're keeping up with everything ready to jump into 2023. Let me know you're engaged. Let me know you're showing up. If you're not showing up, if you're not engaged, please leave. Okay. I don't need you here. Awesome. Love that. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Previously, I had stated that uh, in 2023, here's what I thought was going to happen. Media fatigue. In other words, people getting tired of the same rhetoric, the same, you know, uh, every single news channel echoing the same exact sentence, the same word, uh, overhyping the drama of politics and, and uh, um, you know, riots in cities and, and whatever excuses that were out there, right, that they get promoted. Uh, surprisingly, well, maybe not. Americans, uh, they're pretty still easily influenced by those mainstream media. <laughs> Not everybody, don't get me wrong. There's plenty of people who are calling BS and saying, you know what, I'm not listening to that. I know it's manufactured, uh, but America, you know, United States as a general population is still very easily influenced by popular media, TV channels and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I, I commend if you are one of those who goes against that and to makes an opinion on your own that teaches your kids critical thinking, these kind of things, God bless you. Thank you. I, I 
absolutely surround myself with uh, with you <laughs> because that is the only way that we're going to. Anyway, that's that's a whole. I, I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent there, but I was hopeful that people would get tired of the media. No, media just gets better at adapting. It's it's a marketing thing, right? Um, I did expect that the, there would be more of a no, return to normalcy <laughs> and old habits. And uh, I think we just kind of moved into a new norm. There's some things that we're coming back to, uh, but there's also kind of like, hey, here's the new reality. You know, things as far as like school attendance, uh, you know, working remotely, uh, travel, um, certainly where we shop from. It is, I've seen... Pretty much every grocery store within a 10 mile radius, and I'm assuming this is occurring across the state, across the country. I'm in uh, the South Central Texas area between San Antonio and Austin, Texas. And every single grocery store around me has remodeled to, um, to essentially expand a part of their store and their parking lot to accommodate 30 to 40 parking spots for pickup. Uh, in other words, where people order through an app and they have the groceries, uh, you know, essentially taken out to the curbside. It used to be curbside. Now it's like, okay, now you've got 30 parking spots as if you're going to, uh, you know, a drive-in restaurant or something. And they, they bring it out to you. Or what's happening even more is you've got, you know, the, the, the Uber Eats or, you know, some of these kind of services that are the delivery drivers for you that just bring it to your house. People are like going, well, I don't need to get off my couch if they can just go shopping and bring it to my door. I'll just do that. And so a lot of those, you know, 30, 40 parking spaces uh, are often occupied by these transportation services. People who work, they drive their own vehicle and they make these runs for things like Uber Eats and some of these, I'm drawing a blank on some of the other ones, but um, some of these services where you can either order food or you can, you know, buy things at, at, at a pharmacy or, you know, <laughs> there's all kinds of things, right, you can do, not just transportation, right? Um, Ryan says, uh, Spark by Walmart is huge. So I'm assuming that's also that's the same kind of thing where it's uh, the, the delivery uh, type of um, services or a pickup type of service. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, DoorDash, Instacart. Thank you, Billy. Appreciate that. I was drawing a blank. Uh, that, that helps a lot. Um, I, I would say that in school, in school attendance, in person school attendance, I think it's going to still be damaged. I'm, I'm in my area. I know I'm seeing a lot more where they're, you know, they're talking about like, okay, we're moving from a five day a week to a four day a week because kids don't show up on Fridays, you know. Um, and so then they're talking about like, oh, we'll extend the day, right? I, my my youngest son, he's homeschooled. He's been homeschooled for, for a few years now. And we use a lot of these online um, training platforms that are available now. And he doesn't need to go to school. You know, yes, we do need to find social interaction for him, you know, each week um, and fun things to do outdoors and, and fitness and that kind of stuff. But he cranks through the same amount of schoolwork that arguably, right? I've got, I've got relatives who are teachers who would probably, you know, shut me down on this, you know, with opinion, and that's fine, is I see him get done in an hour what, you, what used to take me, you know, a half day or a full day to do in, in classroom, uh, simply because he can work at his own pace. And so there's some classes where he's, you know, he's, uh, you know, one or two years ahead of, you know, somebody else who's in the same grade, the same age, uh, simply because he's got a higher interest in certain things, right? And so that's when I need to look at like, okay, how do I expand his education in areas that are not typically taught in school or that he's especially interested in, therefore he's going to pursue. Uh, and so this is something where parents have to be a lot more, especially if we have the luxury of being able to work uh, from, from home. Uh, obviously I'm in the studio today, but at the same time, I can also work from home uh, most days. And so can my wife most days. And so we have the, the luxury in our cases that we're in industries where we can, um, we can adapt to what he, you know, to, to his style, right? That changes the way that we shop for things on Amazon, the travel that we take, the things we need to shop for our travel, uh, all these kind of things. Um, we direct our spending based off of where we are located and what our lifestyle is. Um, and, you know, and so we'll definitely see a lot more of that, even with 
economic changes, but there's no way I'm going to go out and take a job where I'm commuting, uh, you know, every single day. It just makes no sense, <laughs> you know, and, unless you're in that specialty job. Now, uh, if you're in uh, like nursing, you know, medical, you don't have a choice, right? That's, that's the job. Uh, but um, yeah, there's, there's, it, you definitely need to be a, a clearly aware of who your target audience is for your product so that you understand what pressures that they're experiencing from work-life balance, from economy, from family, from everything, right? What their needs are versus what their commodity needs are versus their luxury spending is, right? It's their, their discretionary spending. That will help you tune your messaging to focus in on them. That's def definitely something you need to do um, to stand out from your competition. Now, um, I was saying, you know, shift to products supporting new technologies. I will fully admit, I didn't see chat GPT or Bard coming. I'm glad to see it, uh, but like most people, it, uh, it caught me off guard. I knew the AI was being developed, but I had characterized it in a way that it was mostly on specific metrics, right? It's one of the reasons why I kind of uh, diminished the value of some of these AI tools that are in the Amazon space because they're heavy on marketing and less so on what the technology can actually do. Uh, but the, well, the language models add a whole new layer of complexity and use when it comes to uh, the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning and just being able to uh, there's a lot of things that data can help with right a lot of opinion on that one uh it's definitely accelerating the the adoption um i was going to say I, I i wrote down adaptation but i think i'm going to say adoption and innovation of seller tools we'll see a lot more of that this year um, returning to work, um, yeah, I mean, there are more companies certainly that are, are I mean, we've got some that are downsizing, some of the big ones are downsizing, uh, some that are mandating back to work, you know, normal working conditions. I still see a lot of job openings that, you know, all around that, you know, for $15, $20 an hour that nobody wants. Uh, and so it definitely, you know, happens. Inflation, again, I already mentioned this earlier, inflation is something that, uh, I expected to occur. It did actually occur. It, it occurred a lot higher rate than I expected, but it is definitely going to put pressure on uh, the that commodity versus uh, discretionary spending that I was referring to earlier. So let's get into some of the predictions, right? Let's look forward now. Recession, yeah, it'll happen. Because we'll because we'll get we'll get more companies who take the conservative route and they reduce 10, 20 percent of their workforce, uh, especially if they're bloated, you know, if, they, if they're large organizations and they don't necessarily need there is going to be some organizations that adopt uh, artificial intelligence machine learning quickly and therefore can replace um, uh, can replace some of their staff, some of their employees with that type of automation, I think it's got a ways to go. I think we're still uh, a good five years out before we really see a high impact when it comes to employment rates in the United States due to uh, it, the, the work shifting to those who have built, you know, AI type of you know, tools. But it absolutely is going to affect consumer spending, right? Most consumers don't have the foresight in order to um, conserve their spending early. They will start feeling the pinch. You know, if a, if a spouse, for instance, loses their job, they'll start focusing and say, oh, now all of a sudden we've got less money and they, they start feeling that pinch. Okay, now we, we're only going to get the essentials, the commodity items, right? The toilet papers, the milk, the, you know, uh, you know basic foods, that kind of stuff. Um, but then there's also going to be a flip on that. You know, those, those who are enterprising, those who look for new opportunities to bring new products to market, new services to market, to automate the work they, they, they produce so that they can do more with the time they have in a day. Um, I would like to see society move to more of a family balance. Uh, I know that's something that I'm trying to do myself, and it's difficult. It really is. Um, to spend more time with my family and to focus more on what our mutual needs are rather than just, oh, I've got a job to do, I've got a job to do, I've got a job to do. 
I've got a product to produce, I've got a business to run, I've got 10 businesses to run, right? And so that life balance, right? So there's some innovation opportunities there for entrepreneurs, right? Which who, who I'm speaking to. Um, I, my recommendation as in the Amazon space, as a seller, because of what I mentioned earlier, because you're gonna have some of your competition and some other brands, you're gonna have plenty of people who are complaining. It's like, like, oh, traffic is down, sales. Don't get sucked into that, right? Look to how you can control your own product, your own niche, right? Ideally, what you're doing is you are taking advantage of every opportunity you have for your product within your niche. You're looking for ways to, to split test, to improve your product listing, right? I'll show you some examples here soon that you're doing this year round. So you're constantly gaining a slight edge month over month on your competition. So that when everything comes back to normal, normal, you now are a leader in your product niche rather than, oh, now you need to recover now that the market is back. Don't let the market, don't let the economy dictate, don't let your competition dictate how your product sells. You can do better. You're not a victim. You should be gaining ground right now so that you become a dominant player in your niche when it all settles back down to normal. And then people say, oh, I can start selling again. Yeah, well, you're too late because I beat you. That's, that's how that goes, right? All right. Listing optimization is absolutely where I'd start first. Every single day. I see it every single day. I'm asked, hey, how come this product is failing? Because the listing hasn't been updated in two years, in five years. It doesn't talk to the consumer. It talks to the, the search engine. It, there's nothing compelling here. It's not showing up for even half of the search terms that the competition is showing up for. Your listing deserves your attention now. Um, Ryan, let's, sit, let's save your, your question uh, for last. Um, Till the end of this, I want to get. I want to try to get through some of this. Uh, Amazon produced tech in 2023. Certainly, a video. I would expect that Amazon's going to roll out some A/B split testing, some Amazon Experience split testing for video ads. Uh, I'm crossing my fingers. I think they might be a little slow on that one, but hopefully, that is something that they do roll out because that would be cool. Um, I also don't. It would not surprise me at all if Amazon, because they've been on this whole recommendation suggestion bandwagon when it comes to bids and and content titles, why not do it to your product, to your, to your entire product listing? Now, here's what that means. They're probably going to use a variation of their own AI tools rather than a third party, right? They're not going to use Google or OpenAI. They're going to use Amazon's in-house, right? They're probably going to need a few months to go like, oh, gosh, let's come up with a language model if they don't already have one. And then also let's uh, put it into a user interface that makes recommendations to improve a product listing. It'll start with some of the basic things like, hey, you know what, you've got misspellings or your, your, uh, your language uh, grammar is poor, uh, these kind of things. Uh, the tools out there right now are better, right? So don't wait for Amazon to make suggestions to you. Get ahead of it so that when they come around and say, hey, we don't have any suggestions for you or you know better whether or not those suggestions actually uh, are good or bad because it can go either way, you know, it depends on what their recommendations are. But when they, when Amazon does roll this out, your competition is probably going to listen to them and your competition is gonna start leveling up, right? So don't wait until your competition is leveling up with you, be ahead of them so you've got a greater market share. Hearing, a, hearing a, a common theme here. So you're gaining ground, you've got higher market share, by the time that they choose to catch up, okay? Get ahead of it. Uh, Amazon policy, yes, exciting topic. No, it's not. Uh, safety testing, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, more products requiring safety lab testing to reduce Amazon's uh, liability. Primarily, this is gonna be on anything that has to do with topical, you know, beauty, hair, uh, anything that's consumable, food, supplements, whatever the case is. Uh, anything that is touched by a child, right? A toy, a book, doesn't matter. It's got to be safety tested, right? And Amazon's going to get more and more aggressive about going into product niches, shutting down multiple sellers at once 
who don't have on record at Amazon a current and approved safety lab testing, right? And I've even seen where they've gone through and they've cleared everybody out and made people resubmit ones that they already submitted before. So be ready to do that. If you don't have it, if you haven't already uh, had your product, say your number one product, your hero product, uh, safety lab tested by an authorized lab that is on Amazon's provider list, start looking into that now, right? Because they're going to, right? Um, price parity, uh, Amazon is going to continue to feel pressure by companies like Amazon, um, or I'm sorry, by Amazon is going to continue to feel pressure, yes, on themselves, by Walmart, by Shopify, by Target, by some of the other um, shops that, uh, that they're also trying to play this price parity game. Amazon wants to be uh, a low price leader, right? Or they, so they're going to be more aggressive about policing pricing. Uh, that may unfairly affect you if you have a product that is specialized, that is outside of the normal price range of your product niche, which is why you've got to, uh, I do want you to increase your price, but I want to do it, we want you to do it because you're increasing your conversion rate because you changed your messaging of your product listing to focus on the needs and the desires of your target audience. And for you to do that, you got to know who your target audience is, right? Um, and then IP infringement, we're going to see a lot more where some of the AI tools, um, you know, some of the, uh, you know, mid-journey image um, cr uh, creation and chat GPT and Bard type of content creation, where some things are going to start pulling in information that it turns out somebody's copyrighted somewhere. And so there's going to be a lot more lawyers out there looking to, to do copyright suits. And they're going to point the finger at Amazon and say, you're the one ultimately responsible. You've got deep pockets. And Amazon will in turn turn to you and say, we're cracking down on you. And so if we get any reports or we're just going to go out there and check to see is, is, your, are, is your content matching to somebody else's, do you actually own that IP, that trademark, that copyright? Uh, if not, I'm going to suppress you. Uh, then they're more likely. So be careful when you're using AI generated content to make sure it's not also violating somebody else's existing content, their intellectual property. Okay. Uh, image standard compliance um, that had to do with more with things like um, uh, the mid journey. You know, if you're using any of the AI image generators, sometimes they're pulling in um, artwork and photos. Uh, like, for instance, I did one where I, I asked Midjourney, which is one of the AI image generation tools, um, to put me, and I uploaded a picture of me, right? But put me in a tuxedo. And what came back was um, was a, was somebody who didn't really look like me. Uh, it was in a tuxedo, but what it looked like was a blend of, who was it? A couple of actors. Um, including uh, Dwayne Johnson and uh, some other bald guy that's you know an action hero, um, and they kind of blended. It. It's like like it clearly it looks like Dwayne Johnson. It doesn't look like me, right? Um, and so so people you know lawyers working for somebody like you know a Dwayne Johnson and saying like nope that's infringement because that's clearly me. And so you're going to see a lot more of that type of thing where. These tools, you think they're creating something unique that you can then publish out there, and it turns out no, it's actually using learned images and uh, learned data, where the case is that actually somebody else has the the rights to. So, um, yeah, that can definitely <laughs> you kind of have to quality check those uh, in this space. So, listing quality, quality normalization. This is what I was talking about as far as like the more that your competition learns that they can easily improve the messaging on their product listings on their bullet points and their A plus, whatever, uh, by using some of the AI tools like the chat GPTs and BARDs and, and mid journey, like I was just talking about, then the average quality level of the product listings in your niche are going to improve, which is why I want you to get started on it now. Um, again, assume that everybody on average, and I, I, I I'm going to make an arbitrary number of 40% quality rating for within a product niche, right? As far as the product listings go. 
And even if you were to increase yours, if everybody leveled up to 60% quality, if you took the effort in order to bring yours up to 70 or 80%, then you've got a competitive advantage, right? It's not going to match, obviously, what my team, my, my content team can do, right? Because I've seen what they can do, we've proven it. But you still can, on your own, go out there and be better than your competition. So we're going to see the average quality standard is going to raise. Uh, across a product niche, especially the more co competitive you are. If you're in some, in, in what you consider to be a high comp, you know, highly competitive niche, you're definitely going to see more of that because those kind of players know that they need to have everything working uh, concurrently, not just have one thing that's working well, right? So they're going to, uh, you're going to see that pressure of the, the quality even more. Um, we already talked about some of the IP lawyers and that kind of stuff, right? Image generators. Um, all right. Before we move into this last example, give me a one if you learn some new things that you think you're going to be able to run with today. Like get a sip of water here. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. I wasn't expecting the splash of ones. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Man. I love to see this that much engagement. Okay. All right, let me jump in here. And I know some of you had, there was a couple of questions that came across here that I'll try to address toward the end here. I'll, I'll go back up to um, the, uh, oh, <laughs> you know, I actually can. So, so you mentioned, you added on one other thing here. So, you said, I assume ChatGPT will allow the Chinese sellers to blend in more and dominate more. Agree? I do. I absolutely do. It would be pretty easy. In fact, I had even talked about this, uh, I think it was on the last, on the AI webinar, in which I'll give you the link here shortly uh, on the replay of the AI webinar that I did recently that was so popular that I had speculated, I said, knowing how much the Chinese government does this state sponsored kind of budget for technology and business growth and inventory purchase and innovation, these kind of things. Why wouldn't, as a country, why wouldn't the Chinese government come in and say, we're going to build a whole system, maybe a team, whatever, to coordinate with manufacturers who sell on e-commerce, especially in the United States, um, to improve the language model using, you know, America's own language models in order to do it, right? They may incentivize each manufacturer who sells abroad to, um, to improve their listings, right? It's too easy now for a, a tool like ChatGPT to correct the pro common problems of language barriers, of just poorly written listings. And so it would make sense to me if the state, you know, Chinese government wanted to uh, continue to invest in the success of their manufacturers, product manufacturers in, in country, that they could easily invest in that and have an effect across all products, across all manufacturers within the country sold in other marketplaces. Um, so I, I absolutely agree, is that if you are in a niche that has a lot of Chinese sellers. And I think the last statistic I heard was that, uh, was it over 62%? Don't quote me on that, but I think that's what I'm coming up with memory here. 62% of the sellers on Amazon are China, or are, are based in China. That's a, that's a much bigger number than I expected. I just learned about that a few weeks ago much bigger number than I expected. Um, does that mean they're playing unfair? Um, no, they're just more aggressive. It's part of the, it's part of the culture uh, of, there's a bunch of reasons I can go into as far as like why that is, right? Not bad people, just situationally aggressive, right? But what that means, and you can actually probably go into your individual product niche and you can look at something like uh, you know, Helium 10's X-Ray or Jungle Scouts, you know, or Seller Tools Markets, you know, whatever. What are the ones that basically show, okay, here's 
all the search results and here's the country of origin for the sellers and you can see okay how many you know sellers that are that are not us based or uh, some other country right so you can see kind of what is the mix of the top two pages of sellers in your space so that you understand now does that really affect what you're doing right now no it really doesn't right because i'm speculating on what the chinese government could possibly do when it comes to this but what i'm still suggesting is you you start looking at how can you improve the language the messaging on your product listing to do three things you increase the visibility of your product listing as in seo indexing right of of more search terms second is how do you stand out from your competition how do you differentiate yourself from your competition so you're more noticeable creates that hook you know, to bring the shoppers into your product listing. And then third is making sure that the shopper is saying, yes, I want that. Yes, I want that. Yes, I want that as they're going through your product listing, because you quickly, so you succinctly point it out again and again on your secondary images, on your bullet points, on your product description, on your A plus content and your videos, the benefits that shoppers going to get and any kind of unique features that help support that benefit. That's what's going to lock in your shopper and increase your conversion rate. I know this because that's exactly what we do every single day over at Canopy. We've got a phenomenal team that just kills it when it comes to increasing conversion rate for our clients. So I know it works. I know it works very well. It, but most product niches I could walk into and know exactly how to dominate it, starting with the product listing itself, just just by renewing what the product listing is showing. It's easy. <clears throat> All right. Um, <laughs> Ken, the answer is no. <laughs> um, All right. So. Uh, I did promise, of course, uh, I'm going to go through an example here when it comes to chat GPT, and then I'll open it up for a few questions. But here is the, the link that I was talking about for uh, that AI webinar replay. Um, the I don't know if you can see that. If you hold your phone up to the QR code, if you can scan it, uh, somebody try that and let me know if that works. Somebody also test that um, copy or uh, type that link in. Uh, caps are important, too, just to make sure that all works. Uh, this should be just an opt-in form to say, uh, yes, I want to see the replay, send it to me. Um, and then I think it takes you directly to the video. Um, don't play it now, right? Play it afterwards, right? But put, uh, it does the video of the 13 uses of AI um, along with access to a bigger document that we put out too that has like 32, 33, I think it is. Um, uses of AI specifically in the Amazon seller space. So it's, it's pretty cool. We had a lot of love on that one. Uh, QR code does work. Sweet. Thank you. All right. So I compressed down in the AI webinar. One of the things I talked about, um, I compressed it down. I went into more detail on the webinar. But what I was suggesting is the common problem that I see is where most sellers don't really know who their target audience is, what their pain points are, let alone how to speak to them in their listing in order to address their pain and say, I have a solution for you. I don't care if you sell the exact same product as 15 other sellers who source from the same manufacturer who've got the exact same mold. You can still stand out as differentiated and unique from your competition if you simply just um, if you work hard enough at it, right? Part of that is understanding who your target, target audience is who you're speaking to so that you can speak to them about what your product can do for them. So one example that I showed, one series of examples is, let's say that you are, let's just take an Instagram influencer example, right? This is a small example in a huge pool, um, is you can go out to, you can ask chat GPT as an example and say, um, Tell me an Instagram influencer with an, with an audience that is interested in blah, 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 whatever the search term is that's most likely to convert for your product on Amazon um, for, 
you know, cats, you know, right? Or, or, or uh, let's say you do like a cat litter box, right? <clears throat> um, so you say like, who would be interested, you know, uh, tell me a list. Okay, let me rephrase this here because I didn't show the example on the screen here. List the Instagram influencers whose audience would be interested in cat litter boxes, right? And it'll come back and say, okay, here's, here's 10, here's 20, however many you ask for. Um, Instagram influencers that have an audience that would be interested in yours. Great. Um, tell me about what, what's commonly talked about in influencer X, right? right? Take the first one, you put it in there and say, okay, list the most common uh, topics of conversation in, you know, in this group for this influencer on Instagram, right? And it'll, it'll give you a bunch back, right? And you can take each piece of those and you can start looking for clues of what is, is relevant to your product and what's not. And you can start narrowing down your questions, start crafting the prompts, crafting the questions to chat GPT um, in order to, to get better answers. I used list a lot um, rather than say like how or why. I don't want a paragraph. I, want, I prefer the list that it generates. Again, these are guidelines. Just assume that it's going to be 80% correct, 20% wrong, right? Um, I'll also ask like in this influencer group, whatever it is, what are the most common consumer product complaints? And it'll actually go through and it'll list a bunch or it'll speculate on, as some people have found, on what the most common complaints are about consumer products. You're not going to go, well, I've got a product that actually solves, you know, three of these. Cool. You just learned something new about what people might complain about that maybe you did or didn't know and that you could now craft into your messaging on your product listing in order to address one of the most common three complaints that they have. And you can repeat that on the different Instagram groups uh, that uh, in order to, to kind of give in, you know, to understand your target audience better, what some of the conversation they're having, what some of the things they like, they don't like about products. Have you ever done the question? I did this when I first started and it was a rookie maneuver, but have you ever gone out to a Facebook group or, or Instagram group and said like, hey, um, if you were, if you wanted to create a whole brand new product like in this niche, what would you want, right? And then you get crickets. Nobody wants to answer right? because they don't know. They know what their problems are. They don't know what the solution is. That's your job. So um, I used to do that and I never got any response back. <laughs> you know, people are like, like, like yeah, whatever. Um, but this gives you a whole new way of asking about the conversations that are commonly occurring you can focus it down as like, like, tell me about, you know, consumer products or tell me about Siamese cats specifically, you know, whatever. Um, and so, so you start, it, it starts, it starts crafting, it starts giving you enough information that you can start crafting messages, right? So that you can start asking questions like uh, list frequent product frustrations mentioned within Instagram group for X, you know, you can just say in general, right? This came back in this example here that I posted up. Okay, litter box over control solutions. Cat litter that are not eco-friendly. Automatic litter boxes, blah, 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 right? Cat food, cat toys, cat grooming, cat carriers, blah, 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 right? Um, and they actually state, here's, here's the problem, right? The complaint. One of the ones that I pulled on that, I think was cat food in the example that I used in the webinar is cat food that is not healthy or nutritious. And so then I asked, okay, in this group, what are people saying is frustrating or a problem about the cat food that is not healthy or nutritious? And it goes down and gives you another list of specific things, artificial ingredients, this ingredient causes gastric distress, you know, whatever the case is. And you can continue to just drill down until you start, you start identifying. I did this on my own products. I'm like going, I didn't even know that, but it makes sense now that I've heard it. Now, I'm always thinking, say, okay, maybe some of these are speculations, some of the maybe actual observations off of public information, public discussions that people had inside of Instagram, right? 
certainly nothing recent, you know, since chat GPT only goes up through the end of 2021. But it gave me enough new ideas where now I could say like, you know what, I go back and I look at the product listings of my competition and my niche. Nobody else pointed this out. Nobody else says that they solve this. Nobody says that they, they're, nobody's addressing this concern, this frustration. I already know my product does it. In fact, all of my competitors' products solve the same problem, but I'm the first to point it out in my product listing. What do you think that does to the consumer, to the consumer's view of your product listing? It makes them think that you've got a unique product that nobody else has what you have. You brought something new to market when you know perfectly well that your product is just like anybody else's that you're selling against, but you're the first one to mention it. I used to recommend to coaching clients that they go back to their manufacturer. I still do. Um, go back to their manufacturer and ask two questions. What's the most expensive step in the manufacturing process of my product and why? What's the most time-consuming step in the manufacturing process of my product and why? And a lot of times, nobody's ever asked the manufacturer that. And they'll say, it's like, well, it it's, takes longer in order to uh, bake in this coloring and this kind of plastic. Um, it takes two hours in order to do it. Um, and they're like, well, why do you do that? It's like, well, because then it doesn't fade in the sun. I didn't know it didn't fade in the sun. Nobody else has pointed that out. I'm going to point out my product doesn't, you know, you know, stands, you know, colors, you know, the color stands when it's sitting out in the sun. Great to know if you're in Texas. <laughs> um, those kinds of questions, you can now even get multiple insights from a tool like ChatGPT, or I'm sure Bard can do it, or, you know, you can search on Bing, right? Um, in order to get some additional insights that you or maybe your competitors weren't aware of and that certainly nobody else is pointing out, that is how you find some gems to make your product look like it's a brand new product that solves things that nobody else solves, that allows you to increase your conversion rate and then subsequently increase your price because your demand has gone up. many people are going to jump on that? Are you going to jump on it? Tell me in the chat. Let me know. I can speak about this for the next six days. <laughs> All right. So um what should i do now I, you know i let's go through the big ones right i had mentioned things as far as like that search query report right understand how what kind of visibility you have on your against your competition so you know where the gaps are you know where you're strong you know you're weak and start jumping on on some of those right maybe it's a case where hey you know i didn't realize i was so weak on this search term that i know converts really well in my advertising but i'm not really showing up very well maybe i need to improve my advertising maybe i need to change my messaging to address the problems that i found using chat gpt in uh in Instagram follower groups that complained about this product that nobody else is pointing out. And that now I can differentiate myself uh, to competitors. See where I'm going with all that? It all works in combination. Uh, certainly optimize the messaging to differentiate your listing to answer the what's in it for me. The we FM, right? What's in it for me as a consumer if I buy your product? Don't tell me industry terminology. Don't tell me acronyms. Don't tell me, um, statistics and technical specifications of your uh, of your product tell me why do i care what's in the frame what am i going to get out of using your product and then support that with facts with features right uh, most people get seo wrong um so they don't show up for a lot of search terms that usually it's not just a content of volume it's also remember the hidden fields right including a plus content um from a compliance standpoint, I don't know how many of you have seen the, the six fingered hands or the, you know, the, the, the nine fingered uh, foot, uh, dog paws and that kind of stuff. Uh, some of the AI image generators don't do 
digits very well. They don't do fingers, they don't do toes, they don't do paws, you know, claws, that kind of stuff very well. And so it's not uncommon for you to have, you know, you create this great image, you know, of this lifestyle image of people using your product. And then you look down, you're like, wait, wait, why does the 12 year old girl have 16 fingers? Like what happened there, right? It, it's kind of a, a known problem, right? Uh, I saw where somebody says like, like, oh, I don't have any hands, you know, because they didn't want that problem of the fingers. So then what the AI did is uh, they have their arms crossed and like the arms just blend into each other. Like, so it looks just like it's just the square of arm. <laughs> like, that's not what they're expecting. <laughs> but it does. It does happen for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So those are some of the big things that you can jump on right now. Again, I, I would probably strongly recommend go through that the AI webinar that I suggested. Um, for those of you uh, who jumped on late, certainly, you know, certainly give a chance to talk with my team over at Canopy. If you really think that you're in a position where our superpowers are in line with what your needs are, cool. Let's have a conversation. If it's not a good fit, we'll tell you. But we also will tell you, here's some things you need to change. Go change them, you know, and then come back to us when you're, you're at a level that we can play together. Pretty, pretty simple, right? Um, I think that's about it. Let me uh, let me break out of this. Stop sharing here, and we will let me pull up the the chat here really quick and see if there's any what questions are open here. <clears throat> um, if you have any, if you have any last questions, I'll take like five minutes of questions here. So if you have a question you want to make sure, just throw it into the chat right now, and we'll go ahead and address it. Um, D, great question. Okay, so this one, this is actually a good question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read yours off here. So, will updating the listing reduce the ranking, the keyword ranking? Good, great question. I have listings that are ranked BSR less than 50,000 that have terrible copy. I'm concerned that changing them will tank the BSR. Potentially, yes. Uh, it kind of depends on where you're at. Certainly, if you're in a high competitive niche where Amazon is more insensitive to individual words that it goes back and audits, it may find something. If you go to change something major in your product listing, it may go back and do a rescan, if you will, and find some new things that didn't catch before that you got away with, right? That's a lot of the reasons why your competitors are able to get away with some of the, the you know, non-compliant main image that they have that kind of stuff right is because they simply just never changed anything and therefore they got away with it the problem with that of course is it only works until their competition passes them through proper listing optimization so yes there's always a risk but it is far less of a risk than it was than i would say three four years ago Three, four years ago, I didn't dare change my product listings because I didn't want to lose my keyword ranking uh, because Amazon went through and said, oh, I'm going to reset everything and then you're going to start over um, because it used to be able to do that. We, we see that very rare now. Now, if you go in and you replace every piece of content and image on your listing, your SEO is going to change. It may change for the better. It may change for the worse, right? That's part of split testing. One of the things that you can do on this is use Amazon Experiments A-B split testing in order to swap out your main image to, to test different images for conversion rate and then to split test your title, right? If a split test on your title triggers a change, then something has always been broken on your title and you just now got a cut. That's usually what that means. Um, you can go in and you can actually go through and you can do A plus content. You can do bullets now with, with Amazon experiments, right? The first three bullets, I think, which is pretty much all that's visible anyway um, on, for, for mobile platform. But what that does is, yes, there, there's a potential. So I probably wouldn't do it if you have, if you've got multiple products and you've got one hero product, don't start with your hero product. Do it on your secondary, your, your sidekick product, right? Um, that's usually a safer way of approaching, of testing it. So uh, in general, what we see from the agency side, working with hundreds of different uh, accounts, is it's very rare for it to negatively impact ranking and BSR, because we're looking to level up to the next level anyway. So uh, we may have one or two search terms that may slip, 
that we need to chase back through advertising and better listing, you know, tweaks to the listing optimization. But uh, it is it is very rare for anything to simply just drop off because Amazon just had a bad day. It's usually because something was out of compliance, a change was made, it went back to rescan, and it found things that it didn't like that were not in compliance, and you finally got caught. That's most likely when things are changed. So if you know you're doing bad, you may not want to change something. You know, if you know you're you're violating all kinds of terms of service, you probably don't want to change anything because because you'll get it caught. Um, <laughs> okay, so I think that's most of the questions. Uh, I watched a PPC webinar where one of the speakers suggested dropping a list of keywords into your description. Uh, yeah, I've done that. Um, Amazon has is, depends on the on the niche that you're in. So if you are in a product niche in on Amazon where Amazon replaces the traditional product description with uh, A plus, then you can get away with this. You can get away with keyword stuffing a list of search terms, <clears throat> right? Uh, but if it is visible in addition to your A plus, you probably don't want to play that game. You probably want to create something unique uh, that addresses those search terms, but you want to try to want to use something a little more natural. That's kind of where something like a chat GPT actually would probably help you quite a bit and say, hey, create a compelling uh, paragraph describing the benefits of this pro of my product, making sure that you include the following list of search terms. It'll come back with something you can use. It will. Um, cool. All right. Any last questions then? We can wrap it up for the day. I appreciate you guys sticking, sticking all the way to the end. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you got a lot out of this. Hopefully you're taking action on some of the things that I was talking about, especially taking a good look at your product listings about what you can do, because I can guarantee you that if you get ahead of it now, then and start making doing incremental you know monthly a b split testing with amazon experiments not externally internally uh then you're going to continue to gain ground on your competition and you're going to continue to incrementally increase your conversion rate of your product that solves a lot of problems especially if your biggest pain point is i'm losing money on my advertising it's your listing right so that is something where like, I'm not moving stock fast enough out of the FBA, it's your listing. Fix your conversion rate, okay? Uh, do I think 2023 will have AI or tool fatigue, which tools we should use, et cetera? I, I mean, we, we're already starting to see some of the signs that, you know, where people are like, going, okay, shut up about AI, shut up about chat GPT. Cool, that's fine. Um, I am looking at it from a standpoint where, where my thought process continues to evolve because I keep on trying to test to see what else can I do with it. And, and most times I immediately think I'm thinking too small still, meaning that I know that if it took me a day to come up with a, a solution that I thought was brilliant, it's going to take everybody else a day to figure out the same thing. So I don't need to be first. I need to be the one that wins in the end. Similar to what I'm talking about with, you know, why the economy is down, the traffic is down, this is the chance for you to start picking up market share by improving your conversion rate. Um, I'm, I'm trying to look, you know, five, 10 years out, which I'm usually not that good at. So I have to force myself to do it. It's not comfortable. But at the same time, I realize that um, if it's too easy, if I figured it out too easy, it's not because I'm brilliant, it's because it's too easy. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that what you'll see is a lot more people will just be lazy and use it to, uh, I know I've got a 20 year old son in college uh, out of New Orleans. And he says, he goes, yeah, kids are, you know, the students are getting caught all the time turning in papers that are tenfold better quality than they were on their previous paper they submitted to the professor. Um, and so it's obvious, you know, that it's like, okay, you didn't write this. Um, and, and some schools are embracing it and some aren't. So that, those are just an example where somebody is lazy and they simply, they're just taking shortcuts. 
what I was showing you as far as the market research, kind of your audience research, that is a good use of that technology of going in and trying to generate lists of ideas that you can then vet yourself and come up with your own path of what to ask next in order to pinpoint how you can make your product better. When it comes to tools in the Amazon seller space, <clears throat> you're going to get um, some that just say like, oh, hey, you know, we've got a tool that'll write your listings for you. Too easy. That is a seller who's, who's providing, hey, here's a cool little add-on, but they're also being lazy, right? There's already tools in the Amazon space who are saying, yeah, we can do that for you. We'll write your whole product list. Um, again, that's a 70 to 80% solution, which may be better if you're at a 40% and your competitors are at a 40%. Cool. 70% looks great. Do it. But what I look forward to is come next year is when uh, we've had enough time using the various tools, building APIs and accessing multiple systems in order to pull data together to start making connections that we can start thinking a lot more advanced um, uses of the technology in the e-commerce space, not simply like, like, oh, I can just have it write my product listing or, you know, it's, it's just too easy. Right. Or, or post an article uh, showing how, how much of an expert I am in the space. <laughs> right. You're going to get flooded with those this year because that's the lazy path. That's the easy path. Um, so use it. Certainly on your listing optimization, use the tools like that in order to up the quality level of your listing and your messaging to benefit driven messaging to give yourself an advantage and to increase your conversion rate and then start thinking about what's next. Do I really need AI for anything else or, or I, can I now start sourcing additional products because I, I don't have to spend so much time worried about this one product that's not converting well enough and it's failing on me. So that's kind of your path. That's your choice depending on what you feel is, is the best use of your time. You got to figure out what's, what are those $1,000 an hour tasks or $10,000 an hour tasks that you should be doing and the ones that you can hand off. So, uh, Guy, as far as a link to this recording, yes, assuming that Zoom, in fact, did catch this one, that is our history, is that we tend to send it out to everybody who attended today. Uh, we'll get a link to the replay of this one here. The, the one that I had sent before, of course, was the link to, uh, that I shared earlier, um, was the link to the AI uh, webinar. We did the same thing on that one. We sent it out to everybody who signed up for it. So um, thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time on this. Please reach back out to me and tell me you did something with today's information. Um, appreciate you. And I will talk to you soon. Have a good day.